From the editors of Biological Psychiatry and the Society of Biological Psychiatry, this is Biological Psychiatry Live. And I'm Dr. Tamara Gore, the social media editor. And today I have with me an author of a recent paper in our journal. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Tom Pollack. I'm a clinical lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. And I'm also a psychiatrist working in South London with a special interest in neuropsychiatry. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I appreciate it. Um, could I start by asking you, what is currently known about the role of neural inflammation in psychiatric disorders, and more specifically, the, associ the association between NMDA antibodies and psychosis? Okay, well, um, I guess as many of your listeners will know that for the past decade or more even, there's been an explosion of interest in the association between inflammation generally, and brain inflammation in particular, uh, and psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many, many different strands to this, and one particularly compelling one, and the one that I focus my research on, is the relationship between autoimmunity, where the body mounts an immune response against, or in particular I'm interested in, in the brain, and the etiology and the development of psychosis. Mm -hmm. So we know that if you have an autoimmune disorder, you are more likely subsequently to develop psychosis. We also know from these same large-scale epidemiological studies that if you have psychosis, you are more likely to subsequently develop an autoimmune disorder. Mm -hmm. We also know from the genome-wide association studies that some of the most significant loci in contributing risk for psychosis uh, potentially relate to difficulties with the adaptive immune system, things like the HLA region, uh, also loci involved in B-cell development. So there's a strong case that some sort of dysfunction with the adaptive immune system could contribute to the etiology of psychosis. Mm -hmm. But really the, the, the sort of the, the story, the big story really began in 2007 when Josep Dalmau at uh, University of Pennsylvania, I think it was at the time, now in Barcelona, mm -hmm. um, described this disorder called anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, initially in a group of uh, young women who presented, a few of them with sort of um, prodromal flu-like symptoms, but um, really presented with the uh, subacute development of severe psychiatric problems. In most cases, this was psychosis. And they, most of these went on to develop neurological symptoms, so things like seizures, um, movement disorders, including catatonia, which I guess, depending on how you look at it, is either psychiatric or neurological sign mm -hmm. symptom, um, and autonomic dysfunction, and some even coma and death. Um, what's interesting is that in the initial patient series, the vast majority of these patients were initially seen by mental health services rather than neurological services. Mm -hmm. And we now know that there's a proportion of these patients who don't go on to develop these neuro neurological symptoms and who only manifest with these psychiatric symptoms. And so after these initial reports, there was a lot of interest in the obvious possibility amongst psychiatrists, neurologists, and um, it's even outlined in the book by Susanna Cahillon, Brain on Fire, which is her account of her uh, autoimmune psychosis, really. Very um, powerful. It's, it's a wonderful book. I encourage everyone to read it. But she wonders, you know, what proportion of patients who are currently in psychiatric wards or in nursing homes or even we might add just walking the streets involved in community psychiatric services, how many of these might have some sort of immunotherapy responsive autoimmune etiology for their disorder who are missing out on potentially life-changing treatment? And if this proportion is, is really anything at all, this could be revolutionary for psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And so people have begun to look at that question and, and initially people thought, well, this is gonna be super easy to answer, right? All we need to do is is do a blood test on patients, see how many of them have these antibodies uh, which cause encephalitis, and then we have our answer. And unfortunately, like so much else in biological psychiatry, it Not wasn't that easy. That straightforward. And part of the problem is, is that the proportion of patients with these antibodies differed according to which assay you used. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if you did this assay in healthy people as well, there seemed to be a proportion of healthy people who had these antibodies as well. And I should add, we're talking about antibodies in the blood, not antibodies in the cerebrospinal fluid, because we know that if you find antibodies there, they're almost certainly pathogenic. So the big question really is, what is the significance of these antibodies when they're found in the blood in a patient with first episode psychosis? And should we, as psychiatrists, worry about it or just not be bothered at all? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. So what new information does your study provide us clinically? So I guess really what we were trying to do was uh, evaluate an assumption, right? And we, there was this assumption that we found in, in the literature that 
because patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis uh, appear to have a poor response to antipsychotics. Uh, in some cases, they might actually develop adverse effects, things like neuroleptic, neuroleptic malignant syndrome or extra pyramidal symptoms. Mm -hmm. Because these patients have this response to antipsychotics, that patients with the first episode of psychosis with these antibodies would have a similarly poor response. Uh, and the thinking behind that presumably is that if patients with first episode psychosis have these antibodies, then a similar thing is happening to them immunologically in the brain as what's happening in NMDA receptor encephalitis. And mm -hmm. actually there isn't that much information, that much evidence um, in support of that. So what we wanted to do was really test this assumption within the very tightly controlled parameters of a trial. And that trial was the optimized study um, where all patients, these are patients with first episode psychosis uh, recruited in a large EU multi-center study, mm -hmm. um, all patients were either antipsychotic naive or had had minimal antipsychotic exposure. Mm -hmm. They all received, at least in the first phase, four weeks of amisulpride treatment, the antipsychotic amisulpride. And we were interested to see that the patients who had the antibodies, which was about 4% of patients, which is kind of typical as far as these studies go, about 4% of these patients had these antibodies. And those who did, they had a shorter duration of untreated psychosis, which is curious because in NMDA receptor encephalitis, we know that the psychosis develops fairly suddenly or at least subacutely over a matter of days usually. Mm -hmm. Whereas in typical first episode psychosis, you often get this long and drawn out prodrome. So again, that's interesting and worth thinking about. But in terms of symptom severity, there was no difference in the severity um, of initial symptoms in the patients who had the antibodies and those who don't. Mm -hmm. And in terms of response to antipsychotic treatment, we didn't see a difference in uh, in response to treatment, insofar as those patients who had the antibodies got better to the same extent as those who didn't. And it should be added, the remission rate is relatively good in first episode psychosis. And we were talking about 80% of patients with these antibodies who showed a remission of their psychosis in these four weeks of antipsychotic treatment. And in terms of the number of adverse effects and the frequency of adverse effects, there didn't seem to be a difference between those patients who had the antibodies and those who didn't. Um, and so, the question really, I suppose, is, is, is what do you make of this and, and how should that affect our clinical practice? You're stealing my question. So what Sorry. would you make of this and what new strategies for treatment um, might be explored due to your study? Should we be thinking about immunological approaches? Shouldn't we? You know, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think, I think the question of whether you should treat these patients with immunotherapy is, is really important because immunotherapy, or well, the very many different immunotherapies are potentially dangerous if they're given to the wrong people. They all carry with them a risk profile, some more significant than others. But what this study shows is that at least in the initial period, these patients do as well as patients without antibodies mm -hmm. when you treat them with normal antipsychotics. So that actually should be relatively reassuring for yeah. the psychiatrist. But what I think it shows also is that we can't rely on these serum, these blood antibodies alone to make any kind of diagnosis of an autoimmune brain disease. And what this does is it um, corroborates our recent um, guidelines for the recognition and management of autoimmune psychosis. They were published at the very beginning of this year in Lancet Psychiatry, mm -hmm. where we say very clearly that a, a serum, a blood antibody test on its own, cannot lead to a diagnosis of an autoimmune CNS disorder mm -hmm. unless it is supported with other investigations. And by this, we mean MRI, EEG and lumbar puncture, which is really essential. And we're not looking just for the presence of the antibody in the CSF, but we're looking for other signs of brain inflammation, uh, like cell count, uh, unmatched oligoclonal bands, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's only when we see that evidence of brain inflammation that we know that the antibody that we've detected in the blood actually has clinical relevance. And then we might want to think about uh, treating with immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I should add that I think this, this is a very important thing to discuss with patients because increasingly we have had the experience, and I'm sure many of your listeners have, of patients or their relatives coming to you and saying that we want a trial of immunotherapy. We've heard about this autoimmune psychosis, autoimmune encephalitis, and it's very clear, I think, at the moment that outside of the context of a randomized controlled trial, we shouldn't be offering immunotherapy to patients who have serum-only NMDA receptor antibodies. You know, I think this is also really important in just thinking what we started talking about in terms of there being increased focus on neuroinflammation and other disorders such as depression, really sort of 
not a cautionary tale, but really something to think through when we start thinking about modulation of the immune system in treatment of psychiatric disorders. So maybe another conversation for another time, but thank you so much uh, for taking time to speak with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.